All right, everybody, we are back with a brand new case study. Today, we're going to go and actually look at what happens to the digestive system and the gut when you start to use some of these GLP-1 weight loss drugs. Some of these may include Ozempic, which is what we're going to look at today, uh, or semaglutide. Others might be Wegovy. Uh, it could be Manjaro and many others to come. There's literally going to be new weight loss drugs, I would say, debuting every six months on the market. And I've talked about some of these as well. The new Triple G, that if you haven't heard of this one before, I share it at 2749. That's stephencabral.com slash 2749. Uh, but why don't you head on over right now to stephencabral.com slash 2862, because I actually give you this uh, PDF to look at or this image to look at. We're going to go through a case study here today that is a 54-year-old female five foot six, 157 pounds that started to use Ozempic or just a GLP-1 weight loss drug uh, for two months and see what happens to her gut. So let's check this out. Again, I have to give you the disclaimer. I can't share with you any medical advice, uh, medical treatment plans, medical cures, and medical diagnosis. And I'm also not saying that this is going to happen to every individual. However, you can just literally do a Google search for yourself and you will find, this is a direct quote, these GLP-1 drugs slow the movement of food from the stomach into the small intestine. As a result, you may feel full faster and longer, so you eat less. Along with helping to control blood sugar and boost weight loss, GLP-1s and SGLT-2 inhibitors seem to have other major benefits. Now, that's what they tell you online. And what they don't tell you is what happens when you slow the transit of food through your stomach and intestines. And as a integrative health practitioner, a board certified doctor of naturopathy, I'm going to share with you what these underlying root causes look like. I also just have to give you a disclaimer because yes, these drugs work. They do help you lose weight. The latest research shows about 5.9% weight loss of your total body weight uh, at three months, about 10.9% at six months. And I've actually seen 20% or 18 to 20% or more at 12 months. But let's do the math on that. That's about a half a percent of weight loss per week, right? A half a percent per week. So any good quality exercise, nutrition, hormone rebalancing plan, which you actually look at the underlying root causes rather than just use a medication will help you get those same results. In our practice and many other of my colleagues' practices, we look for a half a percent to 1% weight loss on average every single week. That means the average person can lose anywhere between 26 pounds and 50 pounds per year. Now, that's the minimum. People do lose more but you absolutely should be able to lose that amount of weight. We've had people lose double that. Now, the more weight you have to lose, the more easily it is to lose. I'm not going to say that. Okay. But I just, I have to give you the disclaimer because the drugs work, but also not necessarily the healthiest thing to do. Remember, there are no, as they say, free lunches or free rides in this world. So we have a case study here for you today. 54 years old, five foot six, 157 pound female. Primary complaints when they came into our practice, disrupted sleep, feeling burnt out, brittle nails, dry skin, and dry hair. History of hysterectomy at 27 years old, uh, subclinical hypothyroidism based on her report. No pharmaceutical use besides the weight loss drug. Digestive complaints at the time of the lab included bloating and constipation. We've had some people with vomiting on this drug. We've, and again, you can look this up. This is not, we're not the only person. They were on Ozempic for two months, which caused significant constipation. At times, they went a week without a bowel movement. Very rarely ate, just in general, they very rarely ate. And when they did, it was not of nutritional value, maybe one fourth of a cheese sandwich if she could finish it. So what I want to share with you now is called the Candida Metabolic and Vitamins Test. This is a simple at-home lab test that you can actually look at. Are you building up? Do you have greater amounts of yeast and fungal markers, maybe from Candida, right? Or bacterial marker overgrowth. So if you're watching this on video, you get to see all the different markers. There are 18 that we're going through. This is the first page. This is a 71-ish 
biomarker lab test. It goes through neurotransmitter metabolites for mood, mitochondrial markers. Uh, it goes through ketones. It goes through B vitamins, vitamin levels. Uh, it goes through detox factors. I will note, I don't know if there's a direct correlation because I haven't seen the research on this yet, but this individual had very high levels of glutathione. And we don't know if it's from leaky gut and tester permeability here, or could it be even drug related? I think that research needs to be seen. But again, myself, my colleagues that run these labs, uh, and we, we are the largest global functional medicine practice. I don't say that because we're looking for gold stars, but we help people all around the world. We see tens of thousands of labs a year, and that's why I like to do these case studies. So if this is helpful, please let me know in the comments. Uh, then I'll, I will do more case studies. So just let me know. So this is what it looks like. The first nine markers are based on yeast and fungal markers. And yes, the ones number two, Number two, four, five, six, and nine may also be markers for mold, but it's nevertheless in the same family as yeast and fungus. This individual, so if you want to learn how to read this lab, we actually teach this in Integrative Health Practitioner Institute. Um, you can read these labs for yourself. This person has one, two, three, four, five out of nine markers elevated for yeast and fungal overgrowth. So no doubt about it, there are elevated levels of yeast and fungus. So you want your marker, which is the number in that little diamond there, you want it inside of the orange bar if you're just listening to this on a podcast. This person, not only the elevated, here's an example. So 5-hydroxymethyl-2-furic acid, it should be less than a 14. This person's was a 260. Uh, there's another one for aspergillus, is number four. Should be less than a 16. It's a 123. Okay, another one that tests for aspergillus. Should be below or equal to a 1.9. It was a 16. Another one for arabinos, really common marker to this one. If you're going to be elevated, this is the one typically for yeast or candida. Should be below or equal to a 29. It's a 197. So these are some big numbers. All right, so that's yeast and fungus. Now, let's move on to bacteria. And then I'll tell you why all of this most likely transpired. Hipparic acid, we wanted a 613 or below. This is 1,563. But not only that, they have four out of their five markers for bacteria. Now, this is, this is not necessarily bad bacteria. This is beneficial bacteria or commensal bacteria, but it still shouldn't be elevated. So they have five markers that are high normal or out of range, only one in range. Now, We'll get to the last part, and then I'll pull all of this together. The last uh, four markers, 15, 16, 17, and 18, are forms of clostridia-based bacteria. These you absolutely do not want elevated. They can wreak havoc on the immune system and digestive function. Well, this person has three elevated out of the four. One very elevated, out of range. So when you see this and you add them all up, there are 18 markers. They have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 out of the 18 markers elevated. This is, now I have seen uh, candida metabolic and vitamins tests come in uh, higher than this, worse, but not much. This is, this is a very high case. Now the good news is this, all of this can be fixed and all of it can be fixed within about 12 to 16 weeks. That's the good news, okay? Um, let me share with you why first, and then we'll go into maybe the fix just for a moment. So when you slow down digestion, you slow down typically peristaltic movement in the intestines. I'm going to actually show you the model here if you're watching this on video. So this is my buddy Walter, and the stomach leads into about a 20-foot small intestine, 20, 21 feet. That just swirls around, around your belly button and below. And then it leads into the colon, which is about five to six feet long. So what happens is, if that wave-like movement moves food through the 26 feet or so of digestive tract, and when that slows down due to GLP-1 drugs like this or other weight loss drugs, the bacteria and the yeast can feed longer and ferment on the food that it is given. It's not the food's fault, it's the slow peristaltic movement. And it can continue to multiply and grow the yeast, fungus, and bacteria in the gut. 
and especially as we move down the intestinal tract, it's predominantly bacteria. You need bacteria in your gut. You do not want this type of overgrowth, which leads to, not only does it lead to the bloating, the gas, constipation, or maybe loose stool, but it also leads to massive inflammation, water retention, and mo I don't know, I can't say for sure, but this person probably has leaky gut, which will then potentially lead to autoimmune disorders, skin disorders, headaches, rosacea, rashes, migraines, etc. So luckily, I believe we're helping this person early on. We're going to put them on what's called the CBO protocol to rebalance the yeast and the bacteria in the gut to healthy levels, remove any food sensitivities we might find, and then heal and seal back up that gut wall if there is that intestinal permeability. So I wanted to share this with you here today um, really is more of a public service announcement. I'm not here to come down on people using medications or anything like that. That's everyone's decision. Everybody, everybody runs their own life. They're an adult. They get to choose. I just want you to know that there are side effects to medications, that this isn't a free ride, and you don't want to make things worse for yourself in the long run. And we now have to help this person rebuild their digestive system using maybe digestive enzymes, um, a smoothie maybe first thing to start the day, the CBO protocol, rebalance the gut, get things kick-started again, get that, not just remove the yeast bacteria, but actually kick-start that peristaltic movement. And, um, and, and unfortunately, uh, this is an all too common occurrence. So please do feel free to share this uh, with anybody that you believe it could serve. I do believe, hopefully, that it's a public service announcement and we can keep getting the word out to just do things as much as possible, the natural, the safe, and the healthy way. And I would say if you're looking to lose weight, uh, this obviously is a great lab to look at the digestion in the gut, but I would run the stress mood and metabolism test. We can link those up for you today. Uh, it's the number one lab test for the metabolism. It looks at estrogen, progesterone. It looks at cortisol throughout the day, testosterone, DHEA. Uh, it looks at thyroid, T3, T4, TSH, TPO antibodies, insulin levels, hemoglobin A1C, vitamin D, everything that your metabolism is built essentially upon. So that's what I would run if you're really looking to lose weight because then you're going to get a plan along with that as well. So all of this can be found at stephencabral.com slash 2862. I thank you. I appreciate you. Have an amazing day. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.